New Garden Room Company offers a one-stop shop for your garden room, and that includes access to planning professionals. We often receive questions from potential customers regarding the planning requirements and realise it causes a lot of uncertainty and stress. So, we invited a planning expert to come and meet our managing director and discuss the issues impacting you, separating the truths from the myths and cutting through the noise to ensure you become more informed. Hello, I'm Mark Dudes and I'm a Charter Town Planner. My small team and I assemble planning applications, assess land and advise people on general planning activities, including outbuildings and the best way to secure either consent or retrospective permission for those. Thank you, Darren, um, for your time today and inviting me in. We too have lots of inquiries from people who have erected buildings in their garden or made other alterations to their home and maybe didn't have the benefit of planning permission. This can be a problem principally if you're looking to sell the property. So this can foul up an exchange or, or, or foul up a chain of sales. So it's important to have all the paperwork in place at the beginning. In, in some cases, what we find, um, even under your advice or under the, where, where we, we go for planning permission, in some cases when we submit the planning permission, they actually uh, tell us that it's fine, we only need to inspect the drainage. Um, so, but at least we've gone through the motions of putting the planning pl planning app in, um, and they've come back and everything is on public record. You obviously you always get completion certificates, don't you, for your mm. for the work? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're, 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 they're electronic, of course. So, Mark, what are the rules around garden rooms? Garden rooms are governed by the same regulations which cover all types of domestic outbuildings. Those would be things like kennels, swimming pools workshops, sheds, um, enclosures, garages, that type of thing. And those are all referred to in planning circles as outbuildings. And those are governed um, by Statutory Instrument 596 of 2015, um, which is all available on the .gov.uk website. Those rules are not particularly easy to read or interpret in their raw form, but there are some really useful resources available online, um, for example, on the planning portal. So. I understand it can be quite bureaucratic. How do you make this simpler for people, Mark? So the most important thing that people understand about outbuildings is um, that there are two elements to it. There's the dimensions side of it, so how big is something or tall or, or um, it is, how much land it covers in your cartilage. Um, and then the other aspect is the use of the building. So often people focus on just the dimensions of the building when actually they need to also think about how the building is going to be used. Um, because if you use a building in a way that doesn't satisfy the planning regulations, then it triggers the need for a planning application. So let me be clear then, I can't just move Granny in next Tuesday at the bottom of the garden into a shed. That's right, yeah, you can't because that would be considered an ancillary form of residential accommodation, an extension of the house rather than the, the using that building in a way that's incidental to the house. So those two words are quite important in planning, incidental and ancillary. The way I like to think of it is with an incidental use, you have to think of it, would you be doing that if the house wasn't there? And so, for example, would you be working? Would you be in a workshop? Would you be growing vegetables? And the answer is you probably would, in which case that's an incidental use. But with an ancillary use, you're using that space as an extension of the house. And that's particularly true of overnight accommodation. But certainly things like offices, people often work in offices in towns and cities away from their home. So working from an office is, is an example of something that would be considered an incidental use rather than an ancillary use. As we know, during COVID, these things were flying up uh, in every street, in every town, in every city across the UK like, like crazy. Um, we've seen them wedged up against people's back fences, attached to houses. Surely they're up now that they can't do anything about it. When is that going to, will that come back to haunt anybody? We've found a lot of inquiries from people who have erected a structure which doesn't quite meet the regulations and then that might have be holding up a sale of three, four, five different houses further down the chain and it becomes a very stressful process late in, in the day where you need to rush through a planning application one way or another you know, and assuming it's going to be approved but if it's refused or if there's other problems it can really aggravate the, uh, the house sale so it's really important to get the documentation in place from the outset. Okay, so uh, let's put this another way then. Um, let's just imagine you're not 
a planning expert for 10 minutes. How would you go around starting the research for building a garden room? The first thing you need to establish is, um, is your house listed, for example, if you're in an AOMB? <clears throat> Sorry, you are, AOMB? Area of Outstanding Natural Beauty. Okay. Um, if you are uh, in a conservation area, if, if you've had your um, permitted development rights removed um, for whatever reason in the past, it could be a planning application that a previous owner made 20, 30 years ago the, where the council deemed it appropriate at the time, reasonably or otherwise, to remove your permitted development rights and you might be carrying on um, completely unaware that you actually don't have the rights to erect those outbuildings. And we've won a few cases where people have, where we've reinstated those rights and then allowed somebody to build the outbuilding rather than apply for plan permission for the outbuilding in the first place. Okay, so there's a few parameters, a little bit of expert advice that you need before you even start, just to see what size, what shape, what insulation, whether the ground's soft, what sort of uh, base it needs. But there's no reason why, if if you get all that information together, is there, and do it professionally, that you shouldn't get it through planning permission if you want to go that route? No, that's right. I mean, people are often quite reticent about making a planning application, um, but the type of planning applications we're talking about, which are called householder applications, which are typically things like extensions, maybe a loft conversion, you know, a large porch or mm. um, outbuildings, for example, around 90% of those applications are approved nationally. So there's no reason to believe that your application, just because you have to make it, will get refused. And obviously you also have the route to, uh, to go down of appeal. So even if you are refused, you have the opportunity for a second impartial um, party who's the planning inspector to come out and, and assess the decision made by the council. So I can move granny in just not next Tuesday? <laughs> um, well I do recommend getting um, permission in advance so okay. so it's important to when we were going back earlier talking about the difference between the physical dimensions of the building and its use so we sort of covered a bit about the use and understanding that overnight accommodation does require planning permission. New Garden Room Company. More space for your life.